In this edition of Back in History, we bring to you the story of what has today been infamously referred to as the First Liberian Civil War. This war was led by Charles Taylor, and when the losses of the war are counted, Liberia and indeed humanity had lost several persons, and from this moment on, Liberia, the one-time peaceful country in Africa, was never the same again. The scars of the war were pretty too obvious. In this edition, we take you through the trajectory of the war. Welcome to this edition of Back in History. Liberia is a country on the west coast of Africa. It shares boundary with Sierra Leone, Guinea, and Ivory Coast. It also shares boundary with the Atlantic Ocean. Unlike many other African countries, Liberia is comparatively a small country. It covers a land area of 43,000 square meters and has a sizable population of barely 5 million people. Historically, Liberia had been occupied for several years by indigenous people until their population was increased between 1822 and 1861 by the arrival of thousands of freed and freeborn African Americans along with Afro-Caribbeans who relocated to the country. Their relocation was a project of the American Colonization Society which believed that black people would face better chances for freedom and prosperity in Africa than in the United States. The journey of nation building then began and Liberia witnessed the development in various aspects and benefited immensely from donations from abroad. Unlike several other African countries, Liberia witnessed growth and development much earlier. It was comparatively a peaceful country and the people there were easygoing. The cultural milieu of America and the Caribbean, where the majority of them had come from, was replicated in Liberia. There was harmonious coexistence. There was dignity of labor. There was everything going on fine in the country. Liberians could only hope for a better future. There were periodic elections for the election of persons into the various political offices in the country, but for more than a hundred years, only the American Liberians were elected into the office of president. No Aboriginal black person ever occupied the office of president. This jinx got broken when Master Sergeant Samuel Do led a violent coup that removed President William Talbot from the office and took over the reins of power from him in 1980. Sadly, President Talbot was killed in the coup. President Talbot was a miracle librarian. The assassination of President William Talbot seems to have introduced violence into the hitherto quiet and peaceful nation of Liberia. Several American Liberians were offended by the assassination of President Tobit. Master Sergeant Samuel Do moved on with his administration and governed for a number of years until he began to face stiff opposition from within and outside the country. Most of the people that battled him from outside were Liberian citizens who took up arms against his government. One of such persons was Charles Ganke Taylor, himself born of an American Liberian father. At the initial stage, Charles Taylor had no issues with Samuel Do. In fact, he worked closely with him. It is reported that Charles Taylor was a strong supporter of the 1980 Liberian coup d'etat that was led by Samuel Do. For his show of support to Samuel Do's government, Charles Taylor was appointed to the position of Director General of the General Services Agency, GSA, a position that put him in charge of purchasing for the Liberian government during Samuel Do's presidency. His relationship with the government of Samuel Do went on smoothly until 1983 when Samuel Do fired him on allegation of embezzlement of an estimated sum of $1 million. Taylor was set to face trial, but he escaped 
and ran to the United States of America. Taylor was however arrested in the United States by two deputy marshals in Somerville, Massachusetts in May 1984 on a warrant of extradition to face charges of embezzlement of $1 million which arose during his tenure as the Director General of the GSA. In the course of his extradition proceedings, he was detained in the Plymouth County Correctional Facility. On September 15, 1985, Charles Taylor escaped from jail along with four other inmates. Taylor then disappeared from the United States. Taylor resurfaced in Libya, where he took active part in militia training. At that time, Muammar Gaddafi was the supreme leader of Libya. Gaddafi was a revolutionary figure, and throughout his tenure as the leader of Libya, Gaddafi was a strong supporter of persons with revolutionary tendencies, especially those who were determined to rebel against the government in their home countries. Gaddafi provided military training, financial and logistical support to such persons. Charles Taylor thus had no difficulties enlisting the support of Colonel Muammar Gaddafi. After gaining sufficient militia training and having the backing of Gaddafi, Taylor moved from Libya to Ivory Coast. His intention for moving to Ivory Coast was to enable him stay closer to Liberia. His mission in Ivory Coast was for him to embark on a clandestine recruitment of young and vibrant men that will move with him into Liberia and launch an attack against the government of Samodou. To realize this mission, he founded the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, NPFL. He made a lot of recruitment. Some of the persons he recruited were persons who were unhappy with the government of Samodou. He drilled them in physical training and in guerrilla warfare tactics. In December 1989, Charles Taylor and his men moved from Ivory Coast into Liberia across the border and launched an attack to overthrow Samodou. Samodou fought back with his men. Casualties were recorded on both sides. The fighting became intensified by the day and the number of casualties involving even the civilian population increased by the day. Taylor was funded largely by Gaddafi while Samodou fought with state resources and Liberian soldiers. Later on, Taylor's war was funded through the exploitation and sale of state resources like diamond, iron ore, timber, and rubber, with diamond being the most targeted resource. The fight was ferocious and the casualties were many. All was not well and Liberia was no more in peace. This war is what is known in history as the First Liberian Civil War. Charles Taylor's MPFL was extremely brutal in its approach. Anyone who stood on its way, military or civilian, was crushed. It soon gained control of a large part of Liberia. It was feared by many. It recruited more people to join in the fight. At some point, there were many child soldiers in the NPFL and this category of soldiers were quite deadly and brutal. They had the energy to fight and indeed they unleashed mayhem on Liberia in a proportion that was unimaginable. In a matter of time, Taylor and his men were feared by several Liberians. Those that became the targets of Charles Taylor were arrested and tortured, detained and in some cases, they had their vital body parts, such as their hands and legs, chopped off in the most inhuman, horrific, and gruesome manner. Some families were rendered homeless and children were rendered fatherless and motherless. Women were made widows overnight. A lot of women were raped in the process. There was lawlessness in Liberia, and it was not clear how soon the lawlessness would end. In the course of time, a principal commander of Charles Taylor's MPFL 
by name Prince Johnson broke away from the NPFL and founded a splinter militia group with the name Independent National Patriotic Front of Liberia, having the acronym INPFL. This was in September 1990. Taylor was seriously offended by this development and in consequence both groups fought each other ferociously with recorded deaths. They fought for supremacy and for control of the capital Monrovia. They both targeted the dethronement of Samuel Do and the capture of the seat of power. It was a battle with many faces, a battle for supremacy on the one hand and a battle for who will dethrone Samuel Do from power on the other hand. There were casualties on both sides, but the highest casualty was the civilian population that was caught in the crossfire with scores of lives lost in the crossfire. In the course of this battle, Prince Johnson's Independent National Patriotic Front of Liberia INPFL succeeded in capturing Master Sergeant Samuel Do. Samuel Do had been in the fortified presidential palace which was difficult for either Prince Johnson or Taylor to penetrate. Samuel Do had been there for days and was safe. On this fateful day, Samuel Do stepped out of the presidential lodge to meet with the Ekoma commander who just arrived in Liberia at his office by the waterfront. Do went there to ask the commander why he would come to Liberia without seeking to pay a courtesy visit to him as president. While there, at the Ekomok base, Prince Johnson and his men invaded the base and captured Samuel Do. Samuel Do was driven to the INPFL base where he was stripped naked and beaten to pulp. He was seriously maltreated and killed. His body was dismembered and the video of the maltreatment was posted to the public. This marked the end of the reign of Master Sergeant Samuel Do as president of Liberia. The killing of Do did not end the war in Liberia. The two warring factions of Charles Taylor and Prince Johnson continued to fight for the assumption of the seat of power. Prince Johnson insisted on being the successor to Do, while Charles Taylor insisted on the same thing. The war raged on and even became worse. More deaths were recorded. More properties were destroyed. Liberia did not see peace for many years. It was a country in captivity. It was a country in blood. There was the total absence of law and order. There was bloodshed and all was not well with the hitherto peaceful country of Liberia. There was no end in sight and something needed to be done from outside Liberia to assist in the restoration of peace to the country. The regional body ECOWAS then intervened. They called for a ceasefire to no avail. They then created the Economic Community Monitoring Group ECOMOC and commissioned SEM to restore peace to the war-torn country of Liberia. ECOMOC was made up of 4,000 troops drawn from Nigeria, Ghana, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, and Guinea. ECOMOC's presence in Liberia was a big relief to the people as they assisted immensely in restoring a measure of order to Liberia. They succeeded in bringing Taylor and Johnson together for dialogue towards the cessation of hostilities in the country. Several peace meetings were held outside Liberia with Johnson and Taylor in attendance. Most of the meetings, however, failed. Hekomok intensified efforts on the two warring leaders and in a meeting held in Banju, Gambia, an agreement was reached for the formation of an interim government of national unity. Dr. Amos Sawyer was appointed as the leader of the interim government with Bishop Ronald D of the Liberian Council of Churches as the Vice President. 
The interim government was to see to the conduct of election and transition of power to democratically elected government. But Taylor's group did not recognize the interim government. In just a matter of days, hostilities resumed with Taylor's men on the rampage. Killings resumed in the country. At this point, the coma was reinforced in order to protect the interim government. The interim government was able to establish authority over most of Monrovia, but the rest of Liberia remained in the hands of the NPFL or local gangs. Indeed, peace was still far from Liberia. It was still a country in disarray. It was still a country soaked heavily in blood. On 15th October 1992, Taylor and his men launched an assault on Monrovia, the capital of Liberia, with the code name Operation Octopus. They held the capital hostage for not less than two months. It was only by the combined efforts of troops of Ekomo that Taylor and his men were pushed back beyond Monrovia's suburbs. In 1993, Ekomo broke out a peace agreement in Cotonou, Benin Republic. Even this did not last. Hostilities were renewed in May 1994. In all these, ordinary Liberians bore the greatest bronze. Thousands of ordinary people were killed while others were maimed and rendered homeless. In June 1994, the humanitarian situation in Liberia had become deeply concerning and disastrous with about 1.8 million people in need of humanitarian assistance. Humanitarian agencies were ready to offer assistance, but the situation in Liberia was so bad and so risky to allow for effective distribution of any such assistance. Fighting raged on, and Liberia remained a country in need of serious intervention. The factional leaders refused to lay down their arms. Liberia had seen many years of war and had fully become a war-torn area with all the negative consequences of war. Every known fundamental human right was broken. ECOWAS and ECOMOG did not, however, relent in their efforts to restore peace to Liberia. They did this at a cost as ECOMOG also lost several soldiers. The United Nations also got involved. World powers also sought the restoration of peace to Liberia. In August 1995, the main factions in the war signed an agreement to end the war in the whole of Liberia. The peace accord was largely brokered by Flight Lieutenant Jerry Rawlings of Ghana and, in a conference sponsored by ECOWAS, the United Nations, European Union and Organization of African Unity, Charles Taylor agreed to a total ceasefire. Just when Liberians believed that the war had totally ended, heavy fighting again broke out in April 1996. Scores of lives were again lost. Monrovia was heavily destroyed. In August 1996, however, the battles were suspended, leading to the signing of the Abuja Accord in Nigeria. It was then agreed that elections should be conducted in the country to elect a new set of leaders. Preparations were made for the conduct of election and in July 1997 elections were held simultaneously for the presidency and national assembly. Taylor and his men won the election by 75% victory margin over and above 12 other candidates. No other candidate won more than 10% of the votes. It was alleged that the election was widely rigged and that Charles Taylor and his men exerted so much intimidation on the electorate who voted under an atmosphere of fear. At some point, the electorate opted to vote for Taylor for peace to reign. They feared that should anyone else win the election, Taylor and his men will not accept the outcome and violence will still continue in Liberia. There was a popular slogan at the time in Liberia which went thus, quote, You killed my mama, killed my papa, but I will vote for you. End of quote. This type of election slogan could only come from people who lived in fear. 
Charles Taylor won. And on 2nd August 1997, Ruth Perry, chairwoman of the ruling Stroke Transition Council, handed over to Charles Taylor as the 22nd president of Liberia. This brought to an end a long drawn session of hostilities in Liberia, at least for a moment. For the first time from 1989, about eight years, Charles Taylor and his men did not fight anymore in Liberia. They allowed peace to reign. Liberians that had left the country began to return to their homes. A principal actor in the war was now the leader of the country and the war was effectively over. The first Liberian civil war was one of the bloodiest wars in the history of Africa. From 1989 to 1997, the war had claimed more than 300,000 lives and properties worth millions of dollars were destroyed. Millions of Liberians were displaced and rendered refugees in neighboring countries. Children were recruited into the war and given arms to fight and kill. They became radicalized in the most destructive way. The economy of the country was ruined by centrifugal forces that fought relentlessly to have control of Liberia and its resources. The war was horrific, inhuman, and devastating, and ended with scars which were visible both on the physical state of the country and in the hearts of the people, most of whom had lost loved ones and properties to the war. The memory of the first Liberian civil war shall remain green in the hearts of many in Liberia, Africa, and the world, and the scars of the war shall remain in the history books for many more years to come. Thanks for watching this edition of Back in History, and do remember to subscribe to this channel or follow the page for regular notification on every new video. I remain your friend and host, Ekemi Nudim, wishing you the best of time as we continue to dig into the archives to recall the history of Africa and the world.